Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to what's going to be a very exciting panel tonight. My name is Sarah Lefton, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Philanthropy at UJA, um, overseeing the annual panel. I want to welcome you on behalf of UJA and also on behalf of the Jewish Foundation uh, to our webinar tonight. Um, you know, I, I know it's a, it's a crazy time for everybody right now, and you know, people are busy, people are getting used to, I shouldn't say getting used to, but are adjusting temporarily to the new normal. Um, and we've been doing the same at UJA. For many of you um, who are familiar with what we've been doing in the past and what we do every year, you know, UJA really is an organization that looks out for the biggest challenges uh, facing the Jewish community today. And right now those challenges look a little different than they, than they usually do. Um, you know, on any given year, we raise about $60 million in our annual campaign from zero every year to make sure that our community runs the way we know it. So whether it's a birthright trip or Hillel on campus or a Jewish family and child or Rena, and I can name you a hundred more, we raise our money through the annual campaign to make sure that all of those things go and that the community functions um, in a way that we know and love it to function. Um, but this year, in the last five weeks in, in particular, I, I have to tell you, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And I just wanted to share for one quick minute, and I know it's not the purpose of our call tonight, but one quick minute about what we've been seeing um, in the Jewish community and how the challenges are changing just in the need so drastically. Um, in any given year, we're looking out at um, you know, Jewish identity and what's happening to our community. We're looking at fighting anti-Semitism, meeting Jewish poverty or responding to Jewish poverty, um, you know, helping to make sure that people have access to Jewish education and the list goes on. But right now, we're in a situation where our social service agencies in our community and frankly families in our community are struggling in a way that we've never seen in Toronto. Um, you know, we look at the Canadian population in general, and you know, I've, I've been hearing the stat 44% of Canadian households um, have been impacted either by a reduced income or job loss at this point. So it's not an unemployment rate, but 44% of households have been, income, uh, have been impacted in some way, which I, I'm guessing maybe our panelists can comment a little bit on tonight and how that plays into, you know, every family's unique situation. Um, but what we're seeing is need coming from the community in a way, as I said, that we've never seen before. In the last five weeks, and this is just off the top of my head, we have seen a 400% increase in loans, from Jewish Free Loan, which is one of the uh, partner agencies of UJA. We've seen an 85% increase in counseling and addiction services at JAX, right? Um, and that's, again, one of our, our partner agencies dealing with ad addiction and mental health. Um, we've seen a 52% increase in caseload at Jewish Family and Child. We've seen 40% more calls for food from seniors and Holocaust survivors in our community. And this is just the last five weeks. Um, we predict that the full scope of, of needs isn't even clear at this point because um, people haven't really felt the full effect. If they've just been laid off, they, they still may have some savings and things like that. So we're at the beginning, unfortunately, of this journey, even if we are back at work, hopefully, you know, by summer or um, let's just say summer for now, spring or summer, because that's our hope. Um, the needs are just immense. And so UJ has spent the last few weeks completely retooling our grants and allocations from that $60 million that I was talking about and figuring out how we are going to respond very quickly to meet these urgent needs and to help as many people as possible. And in the very beginning, it was literally just about getting people boxes of food. Um, now we're looking at how we're going to help the agencies in our community um, sustain, um, or sustain themselves, come through this. We believe there's a real existential threat to our schools, to our camps, to our social service agencies. And you know, we are completely committed to making sure that people in our community who need help will receive it. So I, I will turn it over and we'll, we'll move on for our program for tonight. But I just wanna thank you all for taking the time to, to dial in. Um, it's, <coughs> you know, it's more important than ever that we come together as a community and we look after the needs of our community and people who need it most because so many people are struggling at the moment. Um, you know, if, if you're interested in getting involved with UJA, we are looking for volunteers to help deliver groceries. We're looking for volunteers to make phone calls to vulnerable community members to check in and see how they're doing and see if they need anything. We've called more than 14,000 people already and we have, you know, tens of thousands more to call. 
please reach out, send the organizer of tonight uh, or someone at UJA a quick email and let us know and we'll put you in touch. Um, if you're in a position and everyone's in a different position, so you know we totally understand, but if you are in a position where you're willing or able to make uh, a contribution or a donation to our emergency fund to help with all of these needs, we estimate there are about $25 million worth of needs beyond our annual campaign right now that we need to take care of um, just to help us get through this. Um, I'm going to share a link in our chat right now. No pressure at all. That's not the purpose of the call tonight. But, um, you know, we've had a lot of questions for how people can help. And if, if you have the ability, you know, I ask you to consider anything that you can possibly give to help those families who right now are really suffering. Um, with that being said, we will turn over to our main program of the night. Uh, we are very excited. I'll let Mo Litsky, uh, who's going to be our moderator, introduce the panel. We're very lucky to have Mo with us tonight as our moderator. Um, Mo is the CEO of Pop. Uh, Prime Quadrant, which is one of Canada's leading investment research and consulting firms. Uh, he's also an accomplished author. And Mo, we turn it over to you and thank you all so much for joining us. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Um, really, I think quite excited about the conversation we're going to have, particularly because we are uh, joined by, you know, effectively three rock stars of Toronto's financial service world. And um, Without any further ado, I just want to quickly introduce them. So number one, we have Brent Belsberg, who is the, the founder and senior managing partner of Torquest, which is one of Canada's most recognized and established private equity firms. Um, Brent serves also on the board of CIBC and is the chair of Sinai Health System and, of course, a member of the Order of Canada. Uh, we, next to Brent, we have Richard. Richard Pilosoff is the founding partner and CEO of RPIA, one of Canada's largest alternative uh, asset managers. And uh, prior to that, Richard spent uh, 25 years at RBC Capital Markets, where he was a managing director and head of uh, global debt markets. Richie spends a lot of time uh, with Brent, as he's also on the Mount Sinai board and uh, campaign chair for the um, Mount Sinai Hospital Foundation. And uh, last, but certainly not least, we have Bruce Herman, who is uh, the Chief Operating Officer of uh, BMO Private Wealth. He's responsible for BMO's 3,200, I, I think I may be wrong, it might be 3,300 investment advisors, private bankers, wealth planners, trust and insurance professionals. And on top of that, if that was um, not enough of a role, he's also the CEO of BMO Private Investment Council. He is a um, regular uh, industry expert that's contributing to various media channels including you know investment executive and global mail so great pleasure to welcome you guys here tonight and you know everyone is on the line you have a really unique opportunity to hear from thought leaders across the gamut of capital markets private equity and credit which i think is really uh exciting perspectives so i'm just going to take one minute to set the stage and then let's dive into the questions that many of you kindly posed as you uh registered for tonight's session so I think it's stating the obvious, but still uh, worthwhile to say that, you know, we're living in unprecedented times. Everything about this period is unprecedented. I mean, we've witnessed some of the most volatile days in the 124 year history of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. In certain markets, we've seen unparalleled correlation, the depth of the economic damage, unemployment, the magnitude and speed of, of that deterioration, as well as the response by governments and central banks with both monetary and fiscal policy. I mean, all of that is absolutely unmatched in magnitude and speed. And then, of course, we have the confluence of all the ways in which all of this affects us, both physically, financially, even psychologically. And the uncertainty of what the future holds is perhaps greater than ever before. So in the backdrop of all that, um, you know, many of us certainly, you know, in this conversation tonight, are looking for clarity and insight, and um, and I, I trust and I'm, I'm looking forward to benefiting from the wise and experienced perspectives of our esteemed panelists um, to, to, to share some of that. So just to start things off, and Brent, maybe I'll start with you, but um, if I could ask each of you, just take two minutes, tell us a little bit about your strategy, the asset class in which you play, the sandbox in which you play, and if I could also impose on each of you to open the evening with a little candid vulnerability in sharing where you have experienced the greatest challenge or your strategies have experienced the greatest challenge in this environment. 
Sure, that's great. Uh, thank you very much, Mo. Uh, and thank you all for uh, listening to all of us tonight. We appreciate it and for your support for UGA. Um, so uh, TorQuest is, uh, I think, Canada's uh, largest mid-market private equity fund. Our strategy is to uh, support Canadian businesses and Canadian owners, principally those who are looking for transition. So sometimes it's a, it's a, a founder of a company who uh, wants to bring his kids into the business, doesn't want to just give them the equity of the business, is looking for a partner to try and provide some capital to him so that he can make the proper transition to his kids. Sometimes it's one of the kids who wants to buy out the father and he, he or she is involved in the business, but his or her siblings are not involved in the business. So she needs capital for that. Sometimes it's just somebody who has a great idea on something they can buy and are looking for acquisition capital to allow them to do it. Or sometimes it's just a transition in general. They think now is the right time for them to sell their business. And all of those things are what we do and how we differentiate from anybody else in Canada. I, I think uh, uh, we always say that uh, there's a lot of sources of capital. Anyone can get money from almost anyone. Might not be so true today, but it has certainly been true until about three weeks ago. Uh, the difference is that, uh, that uh, there are very few uh, firms that have decent EQ and that understand the, what people are going through as they're trying to transition their businesses. And that's how we try and differentiate ourselves from others. You know, on the vulnerability side, when we started, we were one of the only ones. There's lots of capital that has flown into our asset class. And today we're facing challenges that none of us expected to happen. As I said to my uh, limited partners over the last few weeks, if you'd asked me which were our three best businesses uh, uh, four weeks ago, I would have listed three. And which are your three toughest businesses? I would have listed three. Today, they are exactly the opposite, exactly <laughs> the opposite. So we, are, uh, we own a, a large percentage of A&W food services, a thousand franchisees, a third of them closed, two thirds of them running at 50% of previous volumes. They're all small businesses and we have an obligation to help each of those thousand franchisees survive in a very difficult time. And none of that was anticipated a month ago. And, uh, and we're proud to be able to help, but it presents challenges because we don't, we don't have an open window as to where the future is. We have confidence that if you have a great brand and a great company, the world's gonna turn around and come back to where it was. If, if there's a lesson from 2008 and nine or any of the other recessions that I've been through because I'm a lot older than anyone else on this panel uh, is that it does come back. And, and history repeats itself many times. So we have confidence and we have capital. We have a couple of billion dollars of unused capital and we're trying to make it available to those who need it today. Great, thank you, Brent. Richard? Yeah, you having me on the, on the panel and uh, I, I respect uh, what UJA does and I very much respect um, you know, the, the, um, the work that they're doing, especially in this difficult time. I think that everyone I speak to uh, is struggling with uh, the change and, um, and and trying to figure out, uh, you know, what the new world and, you know, the new uh, post-COVID world looks like. So, um, as you very nicely said, Mo, uh, um, I'm a fixed income uh, alternative manager, and I've truly been, I've been at this uh, game for, um, for a long time, since I've been 21 years old. And um, this is, uh, every crisis is different. And uh, this one, for sure, in what I do in being a credit manager or a fixed income manager, uh, sure humbled me um, in many, many ways. Um, we, uh, we were prepared for um, a, 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 an economic environment that was stable, an economic environment that was um, um, looking for um, a number of pieces of different industries that were going to create a, a stable return for our investors. Um, and then um, we were hit by a number of areas, a number of things that um, give us some, some issues over that period, over three weeks, it happened very quickly. Um, one was the, um, the fact that there was a, um, the COVID uh, crisis that created 
um, a significant change for, for what we do. So in the difference in terms of what, what Brent might do, and I know that Bruce is involved in multi-asset class activity, but Brent is involved in a, um, um, a private um, equity business that does not have to mark to market every day. We're involved in a credit over the counter business that has to mark to market every day. And from that perspective, we got hit with an enormous liquidity crisis where the prices of credit on the over the counter market were marked at where prices would clear. What that means is not it's it, the prices were not being um, 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 prices were not being reflective of the actual default probability, but more reflective of liquidity. So we were seeing credits that on March third were trading at one percent, giving on average, and at um, on March tenth we're trading at six or seven percent. So from our perspective, um, that created a significant um, issues in terms of mark to market, and then we had a, a, our largest drawdown from a, that we've ever had from the, from the initial start of our firm in 2009. The other big vulnerability we had, which I was, it was a very difficult period, is that when the markets are shutting down, um, we being involved in the over-the-counter market had to still mark to market. And when we went to actually create, get liquidity from the banks, they weren't there anymore. They were out, they were either uh, at home or they basically were not able to create liquidity. Um, and that again, created a significant dysfunction in the marketplace, which was completely new for us and, uh, and made it even more difficult to, uh, to, to stabilize our portfolio. So we got caught in a in significant, unfortunately use the word shitstorm storm that, that, that created a, a huge amount of um, um, uh, volatility in a, in a, in a sort of asset class that we thought was quite stable. Um, so I'll start with that. And then um, there's a huge amount of, I can, I can discuss, I mean, from what we do, uh, we were definitely in the eye of the storm credit, uh, is where you've, um, you'll see, uh, the federal reserve acting in a significant way and adding, adding liquidity. And, uh, and if you've probably heard that they're actually a, in the next, um, they're starting probably May 1, they're actively going to be involved in the corporate debt market for the first time. And that tells you that there was a huge dysfunction that went on for only two weeks in the month of March. Those two weeks uh, changed, uh, changed my life very, very quickly. Great. Right. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you. And um, uh, thank you, Sarah and Jamie, for, for including me in this conversation. I appreciate it. So I'll, uh, I'll offer up just maybe a little bit different perspective. Uh, so. Uh, I'm with BMO Private Wealth. We're obviously a much larger business. Uh, we're in roughly 45 locations across Canada. We provide comprehensive uh, wealth management advice. So that includes investment management that's, that's offered through our Nesbitt Burns brand or our BMO Private Bank brand, um, as well as trust services, uh, estate and insurance services, really a comprehensive wealth package uh, that we offer our clients. And if I, you know, just take a little uh, different point of view rather than just, uh, you know, certainly not just with respect to the markets, but with respect to what the bigger challenges were, was really about, you know, we are a large organization with a lot of people and the safety of our people and of our clients is paramount. And we're an, an operation that uh, doesn't normally work from home. Um, and so the biggest challenge was, you know, how did we mobilize a large group of people continue to communicate with clients, explain to them what's going on, uh, work with them so that they're, you know, one of the worst things you can do in a crisis, any crisis, frankly, is panic and manage that. Um, explain what you can explain. Things were moving so very quickly. And at the same time, uh, shift our, our, our advisor, our frontline uh, people home and have them fully operational so that they can continue to talk to clients, that they can continue to manage accounts and they can continue to provide relevant advice. Um, and that was a heavy lift, uh, absolutely. Um, but we got it done. And uh, we are now, you know, we're, that took a little over a week um, to move several thousand people and to continue to crank up um, our communication and our touch point with our clients. And I would say that's probably for us in that we, you know, we're not a single uh, asset class manager the way Richard described it. You know, we're providing comprehensive investment management advice, diversified portfolios. Um, our biggest challenge uh, continues to be is, 
making sure we're making the right connections uh, with our clients um, and making sure that they have a plan that we understand why they, you know, what they're doing with their money, that they understand what um, the risks that, that they have taken, um, that they are taking, uh, and making sure that uh, every, really it's an education in, in large part. And then, of course, managing the portfolios and making sure we have continued access to markets and being able to do all the things that we need to do to make good decisions. Thank you. So just to uh, Bruce, and I'm going to actually circle back with you this question and then work our way back. Um, so, I mean, thank you for that background in terms of from an organizational corporate level. Um, if I could actually zero in specifically on the risks that you and your investment team um, and your research and, and uh, as management teams, the risks that they're most concerned about today, um, what would those be? Um, and uh, certainly we're in a world of unknowns, um, but to the extent that it's even remotely possible to handicap some of the unknowns that, that, that are out there. Could you talk a little bit about that and then we'll continue to Richard? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, th I think, we, you know, we're going to, I think we're all going to say something similar. And, and I think the biggest challenge here is, and it's fun to, to compare, you know, this crisis and, and this recession to all the others, but frankly, we haven't had one like this. Um, and we have not had a global health crisis the way this one, uh, anything like this one. Uh, so I'd say like the, big, the biggest challenge is the unknowns and the damage that, you know, COVID-19 has done on the economy. Um, and while we are optimistic that look, we know as Brent started, we know that, uh, you know, markets are gonna turn around. We know the economy will improve. We just don't know when. And so, you know, guessing which way equity markets go isn't part of our investment process. We kind of stick to the things that we know um, and things that we can control. And what we can control largely is our ability to diversify a portfolio. So we are a multi-asset class. We're going to um, make sure that our portfolios are structured in a way that uh, we've got a good balance across all asset classes. I'd say we're probably you know, neutral on equities right now. I'd echo Richard's uh, you know the challenge with with credit uh, had been an amazing you know had been a is an amazing thing to watch frankly uh, but a but a crazy problem to have so as I look at you know how we manage money and how we think about it you know we start with the plan we work with our clients we make sure that uh, you know we're we have alignment on what their what their risk is and what their tolerance is and what their understanding is and. Uh, more importantly, when they think they need that money. And then we really focus on what we can control. And what we can control largely is how we diversify our portfolio and get an understanding of, you know, when we, you know, when to focus on active management, when to focus on passive management, uh, and those kinds of elements. So back to what are we worrying about? I think we're worrying about all the same things that everybody else is, and that is how much damage will ultimately be done to the economy. Um, and therefore, you know, when will we have a better view on what that means to, to companies, their ability to pay dividends, um, the unemployment rate, and when things start to normalize? Bruce, just one clarification on that, just uh, if I could just push back a little bit. I mean, you mentioned you're sort of neutral on equities. Just maybe help uh, us understand, like those that, that are listening and are, know the unemployment rate, knows that the GDP hit, um, know that what we're experiencing is unprecedented and at the same time are looking at the S&P or NASDAQ or Dow Jones and seeing that it's only 13 or 14 percent off, that they're trading at higher equity multiples than perhaps even historical medians, as if it's another day in the park. What are, what are we missing? And how could we be neutral on, on equities at, at a time like this? You know, how are you guys viewing that? So, I mean, so what I would say is like, I don't think it's, we don't think it's a time to be making, and we wouldn't at the best of times think it's time to make big bets in one direction or another. Like that's just simply like not what we would, what we would advise our clients. I think at this point, you know, there's no doubt that there is, um, there are values to be had, uh, bargains to be had, uh, you know, whether it's across the credit space or the equity space or don't doubt all of that exists. My comment towards where we're, why we're, would we neutral to equities, you know, our recommendation would be at this point, 
given all of the uncertainty, we would probably look to rebalance our clients that if, you're, if our clients are 60, 40 investors, 60% equities, 40% fixed incomes, we would probably rebalance uh, to that and, and uh, make sure that we've chosen good active managers that can work within each asset class, like a Richard, uh, who can then find uh, the bargains and the great opportunities. So that's how we would look at it. We'd not necessarily look at it in a way where we would be making any individual sector bet or any individual single stock bet. That, that's, not, that's not part of our process. Got it. And Richie, coming back to you, just, um, you know, you mentioned spreads blowing out and the liquidity drying up in, in the, you know, uh, bond market. Um, has the worst of it passed? And uh, if so, could it could it come back? Could it get worse? And if uh, and if so, like what what are the primary risks that you're most concerned about today? Richard, hello, yes, Richard, Mike was on. Yeah, Mike was on. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know why it was on. Um, so the, the, the equity market, similar to the credit market, is very bifurcated. So essentially, uh, the question asked was the equity market's down 14%, but it's not reflective of the actual um, market's um, split. So there's, there are certain stocks that are quite popular um, and are consider, considered to be still, still popular, the Amazons, the Netflix, the Googles. Um, they're all actually, some of them are at the highs. Then you have many stocks, um, which are more reflective of the overall market or the middle mid market. Like in the, the, if you look at the Russell Index, um, if you look at uh, the airlines, if you look at uh, leisure, they're down 50, 60. The REITs, they're down 50, 60. Some of them are 70% down. The banks are more reflective of the overall economy as well, which are down 30% plus. So that to me tells you that that we're not actually turning the corner, and that the economy still is in a in a muddle. Um, and, um, and that the money is still, there's still a flow of money, but it's, it's, it's the safe hands, uh, when, you know, I think about 10 or 20 years ago was the banks. Now the safe hands where you put your investments is the, uh, the internet stocks. Okay. So that seems to be where the money's flowing to be uh, considered to be safe. And many of the other asset classes are considered to be still in transition. So I think that there's a lot of uh, issues in, in the so-called general economy. Um, that are reflective in the stock market that are um, stocks that are reflective of the of, of general move towards a movement of uh, an improving economy are still not there. The credit market um, is exactly similar to that. So um, uh, we've, we've seen a significant blowout in spreads. We had a, a, a first a unified uh, blowout in spreads where, um, you know, a simple uh, bank spread or simple uh, telecom spread widened substantially from, as I said, um, two or three times or more than that, the actual um, uh, uh, normal spread that it would be. And that was purely on liquidity. And liquidity uh, was, was drying up for a number of reasons. One, uh, the, the decline of the stock market, people were looking to sell their bonds or sell things with liquidity, so they sold treasuries and they would sell then short-term money market funds or corporate bond funds, and that created liquidity. And the second issue, which for us was exceptionally transitional, which was very hard, is to look at the pure credit risk, the credit associated to the actual spread you're gaining for the incremental value of the government spread. And um, that changed dramatically. So essentially, you're basically, we're, we're repricing, call it a GDP growth of 2% annualized to a negative GDP growth in the first quarter of down 30%. So how is different types of industries going to react. So clearly, for example, you'd see like airline bonds, um, some of them are down 30, 40, 50%. And today you saw yesterday UAL actually issued equity at the low. So again, uh, an industry in transition. Um, so there's a number of still sectors that are still trading at substantial distress levels. Some areas of the credit market are trading at stress levels, uh, like REITs, for example, which were trading at 10%. Uh, some of them are trading um, use, using uh, are trading close to seven percent, and then you've had recovery in the uh, highest quality securities, the uh, the AT and T's, the Bell Canada's. They've retraced probably fifty percent of what they were bef uh, before. 
So there's a huge amount of uh, uh, still um, dislocation. And I think, um, you know, as Bruce was saying, um, the uncertainty towards when the economy does actually start, what it looks like is, is creating this sort of bifurcation between good things and bad things. The, the other piece of the question you had, Mo, was um, uh, is, uh, have we seen the worst? Um, I think that markets are fascinating um, in, in terms of repricing. And we've seen a substantial repricing in, in a lot of sectors of the bond market. And um, what the Federal Reserve done, has done is they actually activated um, this corporate bond buying pro program and a direct lending program to corporations. Um, they announced it two weeks ago. They actually haven't bought a bond yet. So the interesting thing is um, people think they're actually buying, but they've announced this $450 billion program, which they can leverage 10 times, which is about a $4.5 trillion program of buying, buying directly bonds and then buying um, uh, lending directly to companies. It's quite complex, and people can ask me questions later on about how they're doing it, but it's not straightforward. But the initial comfort or security that the Fed was going to buy corporate bonds repriced some of the uncertainty. So, Mo, I think a lot of the damage has been done. We're not going to see the widespreads that we saw uh, in that sort of middle of March. And, uh, and then the issue now becomes, what are the areas that are going to go from distress to stress or from stress to back to pure investment grade quality that are going to move forward in the, um, in the new economy. And we will have a new economy. The things will not be similar to the way they were pre-COVID. Sorry for the long answer. Now you're muted, Mo. <laughs> Sorry about that. Richie, just a, just a clarifying thing. You use the uh, airlines as an example. And I'm just wondering, you know, when we're looking at things that are discounted heavily, sometimes they're discounted because they're a bargain, sometimes they're discounted because they deserve to be discounted, and sometimes they're falling knives on their way to zero. Are there industries, and I'm wondering again, in the context of airlines or others, that where the equity could simply be wiped out? And is that a legitimate concern? Are there industries like REITs and craft shares where, again, uh, perhaps look on the, attractive on the surface, but have some fundamental flaws in them that could actually uh, uh, be more reflective of falling knives? So I think very much so, but let me just make one point um, as well. So in the, in, um, the Federal Reserve created these programs, in the UK has created a program, Canada created a smaller program, it's not very clear again what Canada's gonna buy, and the EU has a, a bond buying program as well. So in the UK they stated this, this clear fact, whatever was investment grade before COVID, would be investment grade after COVID, which meant that they didn't want to uh, hurt a company that was was distorted because of its because of a, a pandemic that didn't wasn't because of their activity in the marketplace. So if you look at certain industries like airlines, um, the government has stepped up to sort of support them in many ways. Some of them will may not make it because they were overly leveraged beforehand, and some of them should make it and be supported because they were a high quality company and that service is required when we all come back to the general economy. So you're absolutely correct. Not everyone will make it. And you've seen that definitely in the oil and the oil industry where it's been front page news. And there's some companies that have uh, maintained um, a, 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 you know, a very high rating and have and been able to uh, maintain uh, uh, reasonable spreads. And, and some others are trading at completely um, stressed or um, defaulted levels in, in a very quick order. So again, um, I think the, the clarity is that um, the movement of what occurred is more around um, a quality company that was affected by the, the pandemic and not affected by um, its you know, poor management. Um, and I think that's where the Fed came in to clarify that, uh, that support for lending. You know, that, you know, lending um, and the bond market and the credit market is an enormous part of the functionality that, that actually um, in my view, leads the equity market. If you're not able to have a, a strong capital markets that allows liquidity for corporations to borrow money from money markets to CP to the bond market, um, the, the equity market doesn't function um, in any pure way. So I think that's where um, you're, you'll see some, um, some stability. But there will be losers. Um, I think you just saw this today. Um, uh, one of the large retailers at Victoria's Secret 
is, is obviously looks like they're closing the doors. One of the large uh, PE firms are not going to follow through on their purchase. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because the REIT sector or the real estate sector is probably an extra to fall because you'll see a continuation of companies that are probably on the edge starting to falter. And, and that will, in my view, be another area like the oil and gas sector that will have issues going forward. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, Brent, if, if I could turn over to you, and, and if I could actually change course here a little bit and turn to the opportunity set, um, recognizing, you know, as uh, Richard pointed out, like we haven't really gone through that full distress cycle yet, so we don't really know who's there on the other side and where the real distress buys are. But if, if it was possible, where are you seeing uh, the greatest opportunities today, if anywhere? And um, um, if you're not seeing them yet, where do you anticipate the greatest opportunities being on the other side of this? So um, our business is very much uh, similar to Richard's in the sense that if there is liquidity, there, there is no need to sell. And if there isn't liquidity, then there is a need to find realization on, on your asset. So uh, the government has, in addition to being able to support a lot of the things that Richard talked about or Bruce talked about, has really supported their banks. Uh, they've changed capital ratios. They've they've changed risk weighted assets definitions. They've done all kinds of things to and make sure that banks don't call their loans. And the banks generally are not calling their loans. The banks are there to support their clients. You see it everywhere, and uh, and they're pushing the pushing it down the road as far as they can. They don't have the infrastructure to permit them to take over these companies. And so they're not pushing very hard uh, because they don't want to own the assets. They know that if they did own the assets, they wouldn't know what to do with them. So if you have a relationship with a strong Canadian bank, you can feel fairly comfortable that in the short term, at least, you're not going to have any significant problems. And, uh, and the fear factor has not yet really set in. So the bargains are not there today. Uh, you can't find them, but you know which industries are going to hurt significantly. The banks will be there to support uh, businesses where cash flow matters, but in businesses with significant roll-ups where you're buying things, uh, uh, buying dental clinics with a, uh, with a thought that you're gonna continue to be able to buy hundreds of them over the next little bit, the banks aren't gonna loan you for money for that. In fact, the banks aren't there for many new leveraged loan opportunities are there. They're just not in the market today. So if you wanna buy something, you have to over equitize your acquisition, which changes your, your price metrics and what you're trying to do. So there's, there's gonna be a change. Those private equity funds that were reliant on roll up strategies, they're not gonna be able to borrow that money easily unless they're willing to put in all equity into those deals, which is gonna result in a lowering of the value of those businesses. Don't forget our cost of capital is relatively low when you could borrow six times at 5%. And, uh, and now if, you're, if, if your expected returns are 15 to 20% and you have no leverage in those deals, then the prices of the underlying asset will change. And, that reality has not yet set in. What are we doing? Well, what we're doing today is we're providing or offering to people a level of support beneath the bank so they can continue their strategy. We're offering them a level of convertible debentures or preferred shares, which will enable them to continue with their strategy and allow us to participate in those transactions. We are generally buyers of control positions so we wouldn't like to do that unless there's a path to once values come out, once they come out the other way, they allow us to buy at full retail, not at wholesale, when the values come out the other way. So we are offering those to a lot of people. And if any of your watchers are think they're looking for a little bit of equity to help them support their businesses, that's what we do. That's what we're offering today. Because there isn't visibility on where these companies are gonna come out the other way. You just don't know. No one would have believed Neiman Marcus was in trouble. No one would have believed Victoria's Secret was in trouble. And, and for sure, no one would have thought that no one has walked into a retail car dealership in the last month. As a result, no car, no car industries are open 
and our businesses, which supply aluminum extrusion to the auto industry, are not open either. So EBITDA goes from 70 to $100 million in that business to zero overnight. In fact, to less than zero overnight, because you have to keep your employees there, you have to pay your rents, and you have to keep your equipment working. And when that's the situation you're facing, you're trying to determine when you're going to come out of that. There isn't general clarity today. You have to believe you are going to come out because you are. You have to believe that a great business like that is going to come back to $100 million of EBITDA. It is. It is. You, the question is how long? And if you don't know how long, you don't know how to price it. And if you don't know what you can borrow, you don't know how to price it either. And if there's no pressure on the vendor to sell, he's not going to take a lower price today. If there is pressure on him because the banks aren't standing behind him, then he's going to have to find a source of capital that he needs. And so when we're providing the convertible debentures, we're assuming it's going to come back to the old, old level. It's a little bit more expensive debt in the short term, but it gives somebody the opportunity to ultimately get the price that they always thought they could get for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you mentioned that kind of the, the impact of stimulus on all this. What are some of the knock-on effects that you think will come? In other words, whether it's the increased debt or the money printing, or if there's any chance that we avoid, you know, massive tax increases, like what, what is that? How are you factoring in the potential risk of either inflation or the debt overhang or low growth or et cetera? Well, it's interesting because uh, the programs are relatively short term, a month, two months, three months, U.S. and Canada. They're talking about continuing to roll them. They don't anticipate this lasting for a year and a half. This lasts for a year and a half, and you multiply the amount of dollars that are spent on those programs by seven or six or eight, the dollars become astronomical. You know, there are articles today on how Canada's second worst in the debt, in, the, in, in balance of payments, in, and in, in their levels of, of debt today, and what they've done as a result of this. And, uh, how much flexibility do they have to do seven times as big a program as this? And if they don't do that, what happens? And that's, that's another piece of knowledge that just none of us have. Now, none of us think it is going to last 18 months, but many people think there is a W. Many people think that this is gonna come back. And as, I, as Richie and I sit on the hospital board, today there are very few COVID patients in Mount Sinai Hospital. Very few, but everyone thinks that if you loosen, loosen these regulations too soon, we will see it again, and we will see it again in spades. And if we do, there'll be a need for increased stimulus, and the government does not have the same flexibility that it has this time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Richie, if you could maybe comment on some of the second order effects of stimulus and um, how that might affect uh, the bond markets and your strategy in particular. Yeah, so, you know, I'm not even thinking about second order right now. Uh, I'm trying to um, focus on the here and now, which means uh, around um, just trying to uh, assess liquidity and assess uh, the ability for companies to have enough liquidity, uh, even for uh, securities that will be involved with, like even short term debt, uh, where we might, you know, be, um, you know, we might invest in a two year or three year security for a uh, for a REIT and we want to make sure they have plenty of lines uh, of credit. So second order effect are scary if we'll, <laughs> because the second order effect are around, are around uh, the fact that we are going to uh, have low rates for a long, long time. There's no way, for example, in Canada, even before COVID, that the, the debt to uh, the, the debt factor in the Canadian um, household was already so high how it's going to be handled after this if the equity values in their home goes down uh, and their income is isn't as stable their savings are lower is uh is is a very difficult thought um to to, to look at second order i don't think that there's the same uh, people are talking to me about inflation and buying gold I, i'm less worried about the inflation expectations because i hope there is inflation i hope you have a significant so-called v-shaped recovery where you'll have um um, you know, earnings coming back and, 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 and credit spreads narrowing, but I'm more worried that the overhang in debt, uh, the need to repay this debt uh, is going to leave us in a very vulnerable position and, uh, and, um, and, um, and the so-called risk adjusted return for the average investor, for someone like Bruce to actually look at his 
uh, diversified portfolio is going to again be lower, not higher. So yes, there'll be a, a, a factor where you'll have a, a recovery at one point in time, they'll create um, outsized returns. But then after all that, you're going to see a low rate environment and you're going to see a situation where people are going to be squeezed for a long time. So um, I'm not trying to think about second order, but the second order effect to me is um, a much lower rate environment and a, um, uh, uh, and as well, a low, a low inflation environment. You know you're going to have a lot of debt, Mo, where you think you'll have an exponential inflation impact. The debt is going to, is going to, is going to force um, that buying power lower. So I, I'm more concerned that rates remain uh, much lower and that you don't have an inflation impact. Thank you, Richie. Um, Bruce, if we could um, turn to you. Uh, I think a lot of the questions that came in surrounded uh, pre pref shares, re rate resets, REITs, even uh, dividend paying stocks. A lot of folks that are sort of looking for income. Um, how, how are you looking at the prospects of A, the, the pref shares, which have been hit as hard as they have um, going forward, or dividend paying stocks reducing their dividend, particularly whether it's the banks or other, um, in, in this earnings uh, kind of compressed world let's call it that um how are you thinking about that and uh, as you're putting together portfolios so I, I firstly i mean i would um you know start with uh with dividends and absolutely well i i we don't uh we, we definitely don't believe that uh the bank stocks will will cut cut dividends and We'll find out if I'm right or wrong down the road, um, but I, but uh, but I don't actually believe that uh, that the banks will will cut dividends. Unlike say in other parts of the world where they are cutting dividends or being asked to cut dividends by um, by the central bank or by their government. Um, but we are going to see some companies not make it, and we are going to see dividend cuts. And uh, and dividends are an important uh, part of of individuals income whether they be retirees or not it's in fact, frankly it's been um, an important uh, approach and philosophy in investing for us and for others for some time and in investing in in companies that have stable growing dividend yields pref share is a little different story it means pref shares kind of operate a little bit more like fixed income and uh you know and, and they're going to react to the rates and then and and as you heard richard talk about you know the fixed income market is kind of beginning to settle down. Some of these big dislocations are going away, but pressures are not very liquid. Um, and, and you can have some, some really wild swings. And actually we've experienced that in the last year, there's been some fairly wild uh, swings in just pressures and how they trade, whether they're tied to a reset, a five-year bond or not. The dividend paying stocks, I mean, there are going to be casualties. What we can't predict is, is when and how. And so it comes back to, I think some of the, some of the points um, uh, both Brent and Richard made, which is, you know, when we're going to look at a, at a company, if you're going to do individual stock picking, or you're going to look at an active manager, um, A, I would say, you know, would favor active management because you want to have a, a manager who's going to have uh, some price sensitivity, one and two, you need to be looking at quality companies with good balance sheets who have uh, good cash on hand, who have, uh, access to capital and are in you know uh, parts of the economy that are more likely than not to come out of this okay whenever this is going to be and and rest assured we're going to come out of this and we're you know there will be a new economy but this will pass and we just can't predict uh when so you know i think it comes back to for each individual client to take a second sober look at what is it that we're doing with this money was it retirement income? Is it legacy money? Um, what's the plan with this money? And, and take another look at, at one's financial plan and think in terms of, you know, can they stomach the volatility and continue to stomach the volatility? Um, what do they need and where and, and how to adapt that portfolio to meet where they feel they are today? Um, so I think it's a combination of things. I think it's a combination of, you know, recognizing that we're going to be in a period of volatility. That's not really for everyone, number one. And number two, um, those dividends are going to come down. Uh, there's no question about it. And, and you really need to be very selective on the stocks that, that you're going to choose. And the structure of the market with ETFs makes things move very quickly. 
And again, you know, being two or three steps away from the market makes that all the more difficult. And that's why I think, you know, making sure you know, one allocates to, you know, professional management gets good advice is really important. Mo, you're not, uh, you're on mute. Thank you, thank you. Um, they say, say I have a mark of a wise person is that they don't make the same mistake twice. I think I've done it three times tonight. Um, so uh, the, you, you mentioned earlier and you referenced kind of the, the more traditional 60-40 portfolio. I mean, if, if what Richard is saying is correct and, and interest rates are here, uh, are low interest rates are here to stay, which would make sense given the debt overhanging and a whole bunch of other things. Um, in your mind's eye, is, does that change the relevance of the 60-40 portfolio? Does the shift in correlations that we saw, you know, at least in March for a period of time where, you know, all correlations, not just within, uh, um, I mean, really it was kind of un unprecedented that treasuries and, and gold and equities and everything uh, kind of came down at the same time. Um, does, does that, is there a, a change in how you're viewing portfolio construction and diversification and the roles of asset classes on a go forward basis? Somewhat, but, but not, not meaningfully, I, to be honest. Like, we saw a little bit of this in, in, in the global financial crisis in 08 and 09. And in, and in the moment of a crisis, um, nothing works. And, and we saw that before. I mean, we, we really did see that in you know, March of 09, um, when frankly, you know, we would have thought that all of that money you know, would have gone to gold as a store of value. And gold, you know, we, saw, we saw it rise and we saw other things. But in, but in a crisis, um, in that instant, not a lot works. And, and I mean, there are other uh, compounding factors with respect to you know, government regulation and, and access to capital and how banks are participating in the bond market and all kinds of complicated things that made it, that, that really exacerbated some of the problem. I think also structurally between 08 or 09, the global financial crisis and today, um, you know, the dollars that are in, you know, price insensitive products like ETFs has really changed um, the speed and how markets behave and how money moves. So, you know, in the instant of a crisis, you know, which you know, frankly we're in, although we're seeing, you know, some stabilization, I suppose, although there would be more volatility for a while. You know, I don't think it does necessarily change. You know, fixed income will always pay a very big part of our portfolios. Um, we will begin at some point to see, uh, you know, that the correlation to normalize um, somewhat of an inverse correlation between most fixed income products um, and equities. And investors need to think for the long term. And we you know, can't get caught up in a panic or a short term view um, and then basically paint the future of that one view. This is, things will improve. This is going to take some time. Um, but if you have a, a, you know, a long term view, and that is truly, um, you have the, t the true time horizon and that you need that money at some, you know, you have the time to give, then you're going to be okay. Um, and, and these asset classes will, uh, you know, they will come back to me and, and we'll see it again. And so definitely, um, you know, liquidity is an issue. Liquidity is always an issue. I think it's one of the most underappreciated risks um, in investing full stop. We saw it in other crises in other times, asset back commercial paper, we saw it in global financial, like we've seen it in our history and we do forget about it from time to time until it bites us. So we're definitely more sensitive about liquidity um, and, and uh, whether it's liquidity in public markets or liquidity in private markets, we're definitely more sensitive about that. Uh, Richie, if I could um, turn to you um, and then uh, round off with Brent. Um, you know, uh, Bruce referred to eventually you know, these asset classes will come back. I guess the question is, what what does eventually mean? And if you think about this period, is there any comparables or um, what does this period feel comparable to? Are you thinking of this as a, is this a, a 2008? Is this a, 
70s? Is this a 2001? Is it a 30s? You know, and again, those are fairly different dynamics. We're in a different environment. Any, any thoughts on timelines? I mean, the one thing I will say is a lot of conversation uh, today is like, was, are we gonna have a double dip? When is this gonna come back? I mean, if the rally we're experiencing right now is the rally, we will have experienced the, the quickest turnaround um, effectively in market history. Um, and historically it's taken a few years both to hit a trough and then come out the other side. So how are you thinking about time horizons and, um, and how does that inform your investment decisions and the opportunities that you're making? So, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, it, it's hard to, um, to, to predict um, this, this environment today compared to others. I mean, uh, I was at the bank through 08 and, and that environment was really around, centered around the, the banks themselves having bad assets or assets that were illiquid that had to be liquefied. So that it was centered around the banks um, you know, you had then uh, the uh, 2013 crisis, which the Euro, Euro debt crisis, you had the 98 crisis. Every crisis is a bit different and creates a different set of parameters. So when people ask me, we've, we obviously had a, more, a very difficult month in March. What did you learn from this? Uh, what are the risk factors or the risk um, uh, management factors you missed? I mean, we didn't, we didn't measure a change in GDP uh, uh, transition from, you know, up to to down 30 and a quarter. Um, so it's hard to sort of say um, how, how, I, how, would, how would I look at this environment today in, in, a, in, a, uh, in, in a comparable way. I mean, for us, uh, this transition in terms of um, factors around the ability for a, a stable, a large corporate to actually pay back its debt, uh, short-term debt, uh, an environment where people um, panicked, was uh, very different than it was in 2008. Uh, the fact that um, in the over-the-counter market that I trade, um, where people were in the office, <laughs> um, is another factor that I couldn't actually predict in my risk system. So there's a number of things that today uh, make it very different. And this is why, you know, at the end of the day, it's been obviously a very difficult period. But it's a learning lesson. Uh, it's a learning lesson about, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, what we could do better. But I will say one thing, whatever the new um, crisis will be, which I don't know what it'll be like, whatever we measure for today and we measure for 08 probably won't help me for the next one. It's, it just, that's why, that's why the, the business is so fascinating. Right. And Brent, if I could just uh, close out with you, number one, any thought that you may have on time horizon, but even more importantly, um, is there anything, I mean, you, again, you've been around for a long time, you've been through the various market cycles um, uh, as well. Um, anything that you learned that was truly unique here and which will fundamentally change the way you approach your business going forward? Yeah, for sure that's the case. Mo, I was just going to tell you what an amazing job that you're doing today, but now that you called me old, I'm taking it all <laughs> back right now. <laughs> I saw Ray Richie laughing on that one, and I wasn't sure exactly why. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, like, what is, what is the job of, of everyone on this panel, including you, Mo, is to uh, measure risk, and it's not to avoid risk. If you avoid risk, you'll do nothing. You'll keep your money in T-bills. Even that isn't a definite. You might keep it under the mattress. So the fact is that all of us are being measured on our ability to underwrite risk, take risk, and determine how to, me how to measure it. When people ask me every single week, uh, should retail investors be in private equity, illiquid stocks, I've always told them no. Uh, people have, have started to believe that uh, there's no no premium for illiquid assets that they that uh, they trade the same as every other asset and that if you get a half a point more for being an illiquid asset you should do it and there's no more risk in that they're wrong they're wrong and in this period of time uh, liquidity matters and you're seeing it and so you know when we were to raise money people say well uh you know your returns are are, are down two points and we say, yeah, but we use two levels of leverage, two multiples of leverage, and our competitors use seven multiples of leverage. Put seven multiples on our deals, and you'll see where our returns are. And, 
And so we've always managed conservatively knowing that a recession will come and that we need to be in the right place when that happens and we're willing to give up return for that. But nobody anticipated that would happen in a week and nobody anticipated that it would be this steep this quick and nobody anticipated that a business we have when we measured it and thought the recession will take car sales down from 18 million units to 15 million units. Boy, is that terrible. Look what will happen to our business. We never said it'll take it from 18 million units to zero, to zero. And so uh, nobody could have underwritten the risks that are there. But as we start to look at transactions, our models will look different. Our models will have different levels of risk than they had before. And when we look at them, we're gonna put different kinds of risk into things. We might have said that the oil industry could have a downturn. We never said that AAA, AA oil companies will go bankrupt. We never said that, that, uh, that we couldn't take the credit from, from a major oil company with a AAA credit. We would never have thought that. So our assumptions have changed and they will continue to change to reflect what's happened over the last couple of weeks. And I hope it doesn't make us so conservative that we won't do anything. I don't think that's the case. I think we're going to still be able to underwrite risk and hopefully other people will price it similarly to us. And as a result, we'll be able to buy things in this market. The difficulty is over the last few years, people have taken, have eliminated the risk premiums and things they've done. Prices have moved up that way in real estate, in private equity, in infrastructure deals. People have believed there's no risk in infrastructure deals. They're starting to see that there are. And, uh, and those kinds, that kind of rationality is healthy for the system, just not healthy when you're in the middle of it right now. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, every business that we were involved in has been modeling for slowdowns. Nobody has been modeling for shutdowns. Uh, paralysis is kind of not part of the equation. Um, anyway, I really just want to take, first of all, thank you, Brent. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Bruce. You guys have been tremendous. Um, I just, before we wrap up, I, I do want to uh, reiterate something that Sarah mentioned at the beginning of the night. You know, um, we are here and I, you guys have provided some fantastic insights. Um, and we're deeply grateful for you taking the time to do that. I think for all of us on this call, besides being the beneficiaries of this, I think it's also important to remember that, you know, the community is experiencing greater needs than ever. All of us who are on this call, we, we are among the lucky ones. We have the luxury of talking about our investments, our capital assets. I mean, that we're truly blessed and fortunate. And for the many people that can't even think about the concept, uh, whose lives have been massively disrupted. I mean, anybody who's in the position to support the UJ's COVID relief effort, I can't encourage that enough. There's a link that's provided in the window and I, I, I would you know, uh, strongly recommend and encourage every single person to the extent that they can participate in this campaign. Um, with that, just again, I wanna thank you guys, Bruce, Richard, Brent, you guys are fantastic. Thank you for participating. I hope all of you stay healthy, safe, and uh, have a wonderful evening. And I'm just gonna turn over the uh, conversation back to the wonderful staff at the UJA. Thank you. Thank you all so much. This was so informative and uh, just absolutely wonderful. Thank you. We, we truly, on behalf of UJ, can't thank all of you enough. Um, and just lastly, we wanted to thank our sponsors for this evening, Seidel and Scotiabank. Um, we are so lucky that they've stuck with us through this very uncertain and, and unique time. Um, and we just were so very thankful. And thank you to all of you again. And um, we hope you all have a very wonderful and safe evening and a great rest of your week.